Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on a beautiful Thursday, the morning after our team made the Stanley playoffs. So I think we're kind of impressed that anybody's here, um, even if you're not a hockey fan, it was sort of a big deal. Um, so what we're here to talk about is 5G, uh, because no one else is talking about that, and uh, we thought we'd bring up a new and novel topic. Um, so Larry Downs and I have had this conversation around town, and I don't know if you guys would agree, but you know there is a lot of conversation around this thing called 5G, but as, as often happens inside the Beltway, uh, different people have a different understanding of what it is, what it might mean for them or their particular industry or their constituency. Um, and there's also a little bit of head scratching about, okay, what, how is this really any different than other iterations of network uh, RF technology, and really at heart, is this just you know a faster network, or is there something truly transformative? And we've seen the headlines that you know claim the answer is yes to to that second question. But we wanted to really peel back the onion today and uh, get at the heart of some of these use cases and begin to really understand the ramifications and implications of the country's race to 5G. So without further ado, let me introduce my colleagues uh, who are going to help us understand all of this. And we're going to start off with Larry Downs, who is my colleague at the Georgetown Center. He's, I guess, technically my second boss, since you're the director of the project on the evolution of yeah, innovation and regulation. <laughs> our, our Uber boss is John Mayo, Professor Mayo, sitting in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, Gerald Carlson, who is Vice President, Government Affairs and Public Policy for North America at Ericsson Inc., has joined us, as well as Jordan Crenshaw, who is Assistant Policy Counsel. Is it just CTEC? CTEC or the Chamber Technology Engagement Center. Thank you, because I wasn't sure if I was supposed to pronounce the underscore. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jared. So um, to start us off, I think uh, Mr. Downs is going to walk us through some slides that will attempt to try to Position 5G, I think your theory, the connective theory here is distance, bringing things closer, but I don't want to give away the punchline. All right, great, thank you. Um, um, but one of the things that we had noticed, and we've done several 5G events here at the Georgetown Center, um, and most of them have been focused on technical uh, and policy issues, and that was appropriate, particularly in the you know, last couple of years as, the, as really the specifications uh, for this next generation network were being worked out. Um, but one of the things we noticed was, you know, sort of you talk to regular consumers, you talk to uh, the, 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 even the business uh, media, uh, and certainly if you talk to Wall Street, uh, one of the questions that, that keeps coming up is, what's the use case? What's the business case? What's the investment case for 5G? We understand that, that uh, carriers and, and equipment providers uh, around the world are, are you know, racing, as Carolyn said, to, to deploy this technology and to do so ahead of other countries, other cities, uh, and so it's clear that there's a lot of excitement, but what's not clear is, is a why. Uh, and so really we wanted to, to spend some time this morning talking about, you know, really what's in this, what, how will this change the consumer landscape, how will it change our daily lives, what will it mean for, uh, for competition in this uh, very dynamic space. And so to start us off, what I want to do is just kind of go through kind of my version of this, what does this mean uh, to us. Um, and let me... So uh, well, we can skip that. So one of the problems we have, and th this is not a new problem for 5G, we have the same problem with 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, um, is that 5G is in some ways a marketing term. Uh, and that makes it difficult to say, well, you know, what is it? It's kind of what, what isn't it? Uh, because you have a lot of different companies, again, uh, both on the, on the carrier side and the network side and on the application side, all sort of rushing to, you know, this is sort of similar to what you have with artificial intelligence or blockchain technology. Um, everybody says, you know, what they're doing is 5G, is AI and blockchain. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the reasons it is confusing, especially again as you're talking to uh, consumers, is it's not really entirely clear what it is. Uh, and one of the ways to think about it, as I suggest on this slide, is, you know, it's sort of, if you think about other marketing terms that are also very popular and which are being developed a lot in terms of, you know, connected, smart, and the Internet of Things, uh, those sort of intersect with each other as well. And kind of if you think about 5G, one way to think about it is that it sits uh, in the middle. Now, not, it's not to suggest that, in fact, uh, 5G is only a marketing term, because, in fact, it isn't. It is a very specific set of technologies, very different than previous networks, and sort of in, in, in uh, degrees of magnitude, the difference between, say, 5G and LTE is much greater than the difference between LTE and 3G. 
So this is, in fact, a pretty radical uh, re-architecting of, uh, of mobile communications and really even going back into the core of the Internet itself. Uh, it is uh, quite a dramatic change. Some of these specifications uh, are still in development. So when we talk about, you know, again, people saying we're doing 5G trials or that they, de they deployed 5G at the, uh, the last Olympics Games, um, you know, that's sort of leaning more on the marketing side than on the technical side. But those two are coming together. They are converging. And so we're going to start to see, you know, real 5G as, as, as what the, the, the spec might suggest. And I'm not going to go through any of these technologies. Um, now, it's certainly some of my uh, colleagues. And, and as I said, we've had events uh, uh, over the last couple of years where we have had very technical discussions about many, if not all, of these features. But I didn't want to sort of suggest that this is just a marketing term because, in fact, uh, it, it is not. It is something quite dramatic and quite exciting uh, if you're an engineer, particularly if you're a communications engineer. Um, that, but, you know, all those things come together, make 5G. And again, some of them are at the network level, some of them are down at the equipment level, some of them are at the handset level. Uh, and so, you know, you want to understand that, that 5G is not just a thing. And sometimes I know when we've talked to, um, to journalists, they say, okay, so we're going to build a 5G network. And what they have in their head is imagining that you're just starting from scratch, right? That you're, you know, okay, we're going to put up new towers and we're going to put up, you know, new, and everything is different. Uh, and uh, and that w w that's what we mean when we're building a new network. But in fact, the reality is uh, 5G will, of course, make tremendous use of the existing infrastructure. Uh, and in fact, a uh, big part of what will make 5G work is the existence and ubiquity of 4G LTE networks and the spectrum that they use. So uh, these are technologies that will be introduced into the existing architecture. They're very different. As I say, they're very dramatic. But it's not as if we're literally you know, digging holes in the ground and, and starting over. We will be doing a lot of that, but not exclusively that. Okay, so, um, so let me then just kind of shift here and talk about, as I say now, what is the, what, what is the real uh, business application or the consumer applications here? What, what does this really mean? Uh, and one way of thinking about it, as I say, it's not exclusively this, but it is about connectivity. So, you know, we've, we've now sort of reached the point where there are more cell phones, more smartphones in the world than there are actually people. Uh, so clearly we've gotten, you know, great deployment over the last uh, seven or eight years of that technology. Uh, one of the ways to think about what 5G will be used for is this sort of next generation of connectivity where we now go from people having devices to things themselves being part of the network. So these are sometimes called the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything or connected or smart, uh, depending on who you're talking to. But the idea here is that now we've reached the point uh, and, you know, one way to think about this is it's just, it's just Moore's law. This is just the, the principle that the computing power gets faster and cheaper and smaller and uses, elec uses a less, less electricity all the time. And, in fact, that that's been a, an ongoing phenomenon at a, a sort of an uh, exponential curve. And now we've reached the point where it's cheap enough to put processing power, communications capabilities, small amount of memory in everything uh, or, or sort of and more and more things all along. Uh, the estimate here, sort of, I think, a conservative one is we're talking about, say, 50 billion uh, new Internet-capable or Internet-connected things uh, over the next few years. Uh, the potential here is much bigger than that, right? So the, the, e even back when I was first writing about this in, uh, in the late 1999, early 2000, uh, the, the estimates were that there are 1.5 trillion things in sort of the, 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 the uh, kind of flow of commerce. So, you know, every chair in this room, every screw in every chair in this room, uh, every light bulb, and so on and so forth, that adds up to about 1.5 trillion things. And if you think about the potential uh, that each of those things now becomes intelligent, collecting data, sending data, uh, you know, obviously, you know, aggregating that data together into useful applications or useful things, uh, that's really the potential here. Uh, and why, in fact, a, a, a very different network architecture is going to be required. Obviously, a lot of those things don't, you know, they're not going to be watching video. Um, they're not going to be sending a lot of data. Uh, and they may not be talking all the time. But in, just in terms of where they are and how many they are, uh, our existing networks would never be able to handle 50 billion, let alone 1.5 trillion different things. So this is one, a, a very interesting taxonomy that uh, I found. Uh, this is from uh, 5G Americas of, again, thinking about all the applications and how you might kind of categorize them, slice them, and dice them. 
uh, of what 5G will be used for. Uh, it's not the only way to kind of organize it, but I thought this was a nice way of organizing it. Uh, and you see here a lot of it, and I really, I'm going to just talk mostly about kind of the smart side of things, the smart homes, smart cities, the, some of the healthcare uh, applications. Um, but even there's a whole other category of, of 5G applications that are different. That will be very, very uh, high quality video. Uh, again, so you know, your smartphone will be HD rather than, uh, than, than, uh, than sort of, or even 4K or even 8K quality. Uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, those kinds of applications. I'm not going to really talk much about them, but they're in this mix too. And again, the, one of the reasons that it's complicated or confusing to talk about 5G is it's not just one application. It's not just things talking at a very low level. Some of it is things that the people will use and that will be very high level, very high speed uh, uh, kinds of activities as well. So let's, let's sort of talk about it. And the way to, that I think about the connectivity is kind of moving up from the, from the small to the large. So you know, start with connectivity of, of, of individuals. So you, you can actually go lower than that, but let's just start with with people. And John is, is smiling because uh, he, he's, he's just experienced the, the need for these smart bodies uh, applications. He's just had a knee replacement surgery um, uh, recently. And one of the things that, that is a very big part of, of 5G will be kind of you know, smart bodies or smart things attached to us. Uh, one of the applications that I've been watching for several years is a uh, research project that's uh, funded by the uh, various you know, parts of the, the federal government in the healthcare sector is a company called uh, Veristride. And they make smart shoes. And you might think initially, how you know, trivial, you know, why, why would you, oh, my shoe has to be smart. Now, why would your shoe has to be smart? Well, if, you, uh, if you're recovering from a stroke or you're recovering from uh, a, a, you know, any kind of uh, surgery, uh, you know, knee replacement surgery, for example, one of the things you realize is you have to learn how to walk again. Uh, and what Veristride is doing is developing technology that will give you instantaneous real-time feedback as you're learning how to walk and you step, your shoe will tell you, you know, you've stepped on the wrong part of your foot or, you know, kind of give you immediate biofeedback to get, help you get back to, to walking uh, correctly and safely. So, you know, this is a very serious application. Many of the other smart uh, health applications are equally important. Uh, coupled with 3D printing, we now have a revolution in prosthetics, of course. Uh, so for, you know, wounded warriors or for other people, uh, uh, particularly sufferers of, of diabetes, if they have to have a, a limb replacement, uh, we now have gone from a world where, you know, sort of one size didn't fit all for prosthetics to custom uh, 3D printed prosthetics, they will also have sensors and other technology in them that will allow them to communicate uh, in ways that will make it much easier for you to integrate those prosthetics. And in fact, you know, if you, if you watch the, uh, the, the Special Olympics, you see now that effectively these, these people are, are better than human. Uh, in, in many ways, their capabilities are, are, are enhanced rather than just uh, replaced. So a lot of that connectivity, again, uh, will require some of the important networking technologies that, that 5G offers. Uh, this will be a, a big part of uh, what, what 5G will be good for. So then we move up from ourselves to our homes. Uh, and of course, this is where really we started the conversation about the Internet of Things many years ago, this idea that you know, the refrigerator will be able to order milk for us when it realizes we're running out, or it'll be able to tell us when something is about to spoil, because everything in the refrigerator is talking to the refrigerator, the refrigerator is talking to the rest of the home network, and is able to then you know, talk to the store and order things uh, for us. Again, this may seem uh, like a sort of silly or trivial application, but um, you know, we, we have uh, in this country and in mo much of the developed world a rapidly aging population. Um, and uh, many of these technologies will be essential uh, for seniors who want to age in place, who want to stay in their homes uh, and, and be able to you know, sort of live uh, normal lives uh, as long as possible. So again, I think you know, these technologies, although when you, you know, sort of go to the, the trade shows, you go to CES, you just see the kind of goofy version of it where, oh, this is the intelligent uh, plant uh, uh, pot that will tell you when it's time to water the plant. Um, not a bad application, but not exactly life-changing. But in fact, underneath that uh, are some very significant uh, applications that will affect uh, how we live and, and where we live. And as, as someone about to enter the aging population category, uh, I take this one uh, particularly seriously. 
Um, uh, many of the questions that you sometimes get about 5G is, is this just for urban users? Is it just a faster network uh, for, for urban users to get you know, more data or better video or, or some of these new gaming technologies? And in fact, there's very important, significant rural applications for 5G as well. Uh, smart farms, again, it may be trivial to think about the flower pot needing to be watered, but uh, very important if you have a, a field, several acres, uh, you have sensors in the ground, you have drones in the air, uh, you're monitoring the weather, you're mon monitoring soil conditions, you're monitoring the chemistry of the soil, um, and all of that, again, uh, these are not uh, sort of uh, high uh, throughput applications, but they are applications that need uh, lots and lots of capacity because you will be collecting on a real-time basis all kinds of data, consolidating that in the cloud, using that for analytic purposes, you know, individually to come back to the farm farmer and say it's time to put fertilizer in field A or you know, there's a problem, you know, there's crows eating your corn in field C, the drone picked that up. Uh, but also even on a global basis to say, okay, now that we have all these farms that are communicating, um, what can we learn about more effective ways to fertilize or, or you know, more sustainable ways of farming uh, as we realize that you know, we can, you know, we're, we're putting too much water, we're putting too much fertilizer, we're wasting resources. This will help us to, uh, to sort of improve that as well. So very important rural applications. And one thing that may in fact happen is that these kind of industrial applications for 5G in rural settings will, will sort of encourage deployment of infrastructure that will, as a side effect, close what remains of the digital divide for the people living in the farms who may now not have particularly good connectivity. Uh, what may drive better connectivity for them individually is that the farm needed the connectivity and then the side effect is that the people get it uh, as well. So uh, this could be uh, very important not only for the farming applications but also for rural users uh, who in some parts of, the, of the, the country and certainly around the world uh, don't have the, the, the fastest or, or most reliable service today. And then we move up one level further and we have a whole range of applications having to do with cities, with the sort of regional areas or big infrastructure. Uh, we've already seen very interesting developments over the last uh, 10 years in the area of smart cities, uh, smart, grid, smart energy grids. Again, a lot of this has to do with improving resource utilization uh, sort of uh, uh, for sustainability purposes. Uh, but some very interesting applications we've already seen. Uh, I think the picture here is uh, referencing Barcelona, which has been a very early uh, developer, a real pioneer of, of smart city applications. Things like uh, street lights, making sure that the lights go on at the right time, that when lights burn out, that, the enforce, that that's immediately noted uh, to the maintenance crews so that they can replace lights for, for public safety purposes. Uh, garbage uh, pickup and so on uh, for, for sort of health and safety. Um, and other things like you know, parking and traffic, uh, which again uh, can greatly improve productivity. You're not spending all your time driving around looking for a parking space. The parking space tells you where it is. In fact, it ultimately tells your car where it is and the car just goes. You're, you know, you're sort of a passive part of that transaction. Um, all of these things can really improve urban life and sort of, you know, may wind up changing where we work and how we work. You may, uh, in fact, uh, find, again, through uh, improved, uh, you know, bandwidth, uh, teleconferencing becomes much more reliable and sort of much more human uh, to the extent that, that uh, telecommuting or working from home uh, becomes even more uh, of, a, of a viable option than it is already today. And then finally, moving up to sort of the top level, just thinking about a smart infrastructure, smart roads, smart vehicles, the interaction between the roads and the cars and between the cars and each other. Uh, this again will be a very large application of 5G. And here we'll be relying on another feature of the, of the technology list I showed you before, which is very, very low latency, very, very high reliability. So uh, when, when sort of when the farm, when the, the crops are communicating about their status, uh, if there's a one second delay, it's not a big deal. But if the car is communicating to another car that's five feet away about its status, a one second delay or even a lost packet uh, can be a matter of life and death. So one of the features of, of the 5G spe specification is extremely low latency, very short delays in communication and uh, a very high reliability and very secure transactions and communications as well. 
that is principally uh, going to the application that will principally benefit from that in this case would be autonomous vehicles and particularly relationship of those vehicles to each other. So one of the things uh, that the, the smart car people are saying is, uh, you know, once this technology is working and fully deployed, uh, the nature of the car construction will change. You won't need all that steel uh, because it's fact, you know, most of the steel is there to take over for the case when the human driver makes an error. That's what really results in 40 to 50,000 traffic deaths a year in this country. Uh, as smart autonomous vehicles and smart infrastructure becomes more reliable, uh, that rate will presumably decline rapidly and the cars themselves may be made of different materials. Uh, we may also be able to platoon them. That's the, the term they use in trucking, where in fact, you know, now, you know, of course, you've always been taught leave uh, one car length for every 10 miles an hour. Again, if you have a smart infrastructure that's reliable, uh, you may be able to, uh, you know, have car vehicles be traveling at high speeds much closer together, uh, communicating with each other and communicating with the road. So this could make dramatic improvements, again, in productivity as well as uh, sustainability uh, once it's all uh, deployed. Okay, so I've already kind of given you a hint of this, but as I say, um, when people talk, again, if, you, if you're you know, talking, and of course today, most of the, uh, the vendors that are selling products in the Internet of Things, um, they're sort of selling gimmicks, gadgets, kind of consumer-related uh, toys. Um, and that's, that's how things start, that's not a criticism, but the reality is uh, that there's much deeper value to those technologies and therefore much deeper value to the 5G networks that will support those applications. So I already mentioned, as I say, this is very important for seniors, uh, aging in place, uh, the smart home will be a, a, a big uh, improvement to, the, to that capacity. Again, from the autonomous vehicle standpoint, uh, any, you know, most of us are, are actually terrible drivers, human beings were not really uh, created to, to, to manage that particular task. Um, and in fact, at some point we will have, if not already, we will have vehicles that are better drivers than, than we are. Uh, and the, the impact on, on traffic fatalities could be extreme, extremely significant and obviously therefore very important. In terms of public safety uh, and, and things of that nature with, the, with drone technology, these are all things that right now they look like toys and gimmicks, but the point I want to make is that they have long-term implications that, that, that really are quite uh, socially important, socially valuable, and also we should say will we'll change many, you know, will change the nature of work, it may change the nature of aging, uh, it may change a lot of things um, that, of course, we can't predict or, or know today, but that will, uh, that will cause a certain amount of social anxiety as any new technology or any technological revolution historically does. Skip that part, um, just in the interest of time. Um, but the, the last point I want to make, because I don't want to take time away from my, uh, my colleagues here, is that, uh, of course, uh, this being Washington and this being the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, we, we, we can't not talk about the policy implications of a lot of this. Um, if, in fact, any subset, of course, you know, I can't predict when any of those big picture uh, changes will happen, those, those sort of big applications will, will become viable. Uh, but if any of them become viable in whatever time frame, five years, ten years, uh, the, the economic and social considerations will be very significant. So um, if we believe that there's potential there, even if we don't know quite how big and how fast it's going to come, uh, certainly we want to do things that will encourage, incentivize uh, that development to happen quickly, efficiently, uh, safely. Uh, and, and so, of course, a lot of this policy uh, issues, things like uh, making sure we have the spectrum, uh, lots of it, and in different uh, frequencies that we need to deploy these networks is there, uh, that we have sort of local uh, conditions that are sort of suitable. As I said at the beginning, it's not like we're starting over, but we will be doing a lot of construction. Uh, we'll be adding a, a lot of equipment to existing uh, cellular infrastructure. We'll be putting thousands, maybe millions of small antennas uh, in existing infrastructure, so on buildings, inside buildings. Uh, on existing utility towers, so making sure that we have efficient and, and sort of common sense rules for getting that deployed at the cheapest but cost but also safely uh, will be very important, at the, particularly at the local level, if not at the, the state level. And some of that uh, is already happening. The FCC, states, individual cities are all kind of you know, working around figuring out who's in the best position to, to sort of set these best practices or these rules. And I think we're making good progress, but we want to make sure that we, uh, we continue to make good progress. 
Um, uh, what else did I mention? Oh, so yeah, so making sure, again, in some high cost areas, so it's very important if you have an autonomous vehicle and you're driving out of the city limits, you, know, you don't want it to stop just because you've, you've kind of left. So we want to make sure that the infrastructure is, uh, is deployed everywhere. Uh, and again, this may be a, a, a real opportunity to, uh, to close what's left of the digital divide. Uh, but that may require incentives, as we've had uh, for the last you know, decades, to make sure that in high cost areas or very remote rural areas or mountainous regions, which is most of this country, um, that we have the ability to get the infrastructure we need, uh, overcoming any kind of economic obstacles that we have there. So I think that's it. I'm going to stop there um, and uh, send it back to Carolyn and my, and my panelists, and uh, just to, to hopefully gave you a sense of why this really matters, again, from a consumer and a business standpoint, uh, and that we're not just kind of talking about a neat new set of technologies. Thank Thanks. you, Larry. Okay. Larry, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. Is there any way we could go back to your slide, yeah. um, the taxonomy slide, just while we're chatting here? That probably is a good place to, to have it. Perfect. <clears throat> um, let me start, Jared, with you, if that's OK. Sure. Um, in terms of your constituency, can you just give us sort of a bigger picture, kind of how is what we were just hearing about from Larry relevant to the variety of different kinds of companies and sectors that are all participating with you guys? Sure thing. Actually, uh, Larry you know, kind of spoke to my heart because actually one of my other hats at the chamber is managing our autonomous vehicle portfolio. And uh, actually got a chance to experience some of this technology firsthand with having my life in the hands of a telecommunications network. Uh, over at CES where I'm sitting in a remotely driven vehicle that uh, Phantom Auto operates. And there's a driver actually sitting at a computer console, almost looks like a video game terminal, out in Mountain View, California, while I'm on the Las Vegas Strip driving around and without any incident or anything like that. And when it comes to autonomous vehicles, I think as Larry pointed out, this technology, you know, first of all, I will have a caveat that not all AV uh, manufacturers are using 5G for safety, as we've seen in Waymo's safety report. They rely on other technology for safety, but others are um, when it comes to V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle, uh, connectivity. Um, one of the things about platooning that I find so fascinating with the ability to put cars together in such a close proximity is the ability to uh, more efficiently handle fuel, uh, so that way you're cutting down on uh, environmental emissions, CO2, uh, things like that as well. Um, so in terms of what can be done with autonomy, I, uh, with autonomous vehicles, I think it's relatively exciting what we're seeing right now. Um, also too, I mean, you know, the, the other tech companies that are out there are uh, doing a lot in the public safety sector. Microsoft and partners are working on technology with law enforcement that if you have a firearm that discharges from your holster, if you're a police officer, it will use the network to communicate that in real time. Uh, to, uh, to dispatchers, and that way they're able to, to get law enforcement out there quicker for assistance. Uh, that's out there uh, from a manufacturing perspective. Um, we're seeing 5G being used to connect sensors to uh, cut down on maintenance costs. Uh, you know, one example I, I know in, uh, is that in manufacturing, uh, there are connected screwdrivers, and they can actually uh, communicate uh, better to uh, the cloud and uh, let uh, the, the plant uh, runners actually know when something needs to be maintained at a certain time, so that way you're cutting back on uh, time spent uh, in, in doing maintenance and manufacturing. Uh, a lot of other uh, just really exciting uh, use cases. I mean, telehealth is what, another one as well, too. I mean, I know, uh, um, you know UVA actually uh, has had a telehealth program in which uh, recent uh, incidents that they've had there, they've been able to cut down on casualties because they've been able to get uh, data in real time, but when you're putting all this together, um, all this data, you are going to need a very reliable 5G network to handle all this to get everything with, with low latency uh, to get everything in real time. But just so many different uh, you know, use cases across the entire spectrum that I think are entirely fascinating that we're going to be dealing with. Can you talk to us a little bit about the fact I just broke the table? Um, <laughs> we'll just lean on it this way to prevent right. it from crashing to the floor. Not a smart device. Um, <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the implications. I think Larry touched on this a little bit for um, businesses in rural America. 
uh, there, there seems to, I think there was a misperception maybe early on uh, last year, maybe the beginning of this year, that somehow 5G was really just an urban play for the network operators. And I think what we're hearing is, in fact, that's not the case, that there are very significant use cases um, that would be specifically applicable in rural areas. Well, th there are a lot of different IoT use cases that are out there. I mean, obviously, um, you know, you're looking at, you know, an example, uh, you know, wine producers and vineyards are using uh, sensors to look at uh, you know, humidity, also looking at you know, uh, the uh, water levels in soil, also getting uh, pH levels. So being able to communicate that into the cloud and being able to do data analytics, I mean, that can also be applied, applied to other farming. I mean, I think that in terms of 5G, yes, it's, it's a little bit slower getting out to the rural areas, but I think that there are use cases that could demand 5G, though. So let me um, go to our friend from Ericsson and, and hear a little bit about, you know, global player and all of this. You guys have been a market leader. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing uh, on use cases, both those that perhaps you guys are seeing are relevant to network operators in terms of mm -hmm. how they operate and can leverage capacity and, and reduce uh, the cost and latency and whatnot, but also any consumer-facing uh, use cases. Sure. Thank you. Um, and uh, you covered so many use cases, I appreciate it. I'm going to refer to your presentation in the near future, I'm sure. Um, when we look at use cases and uh, the way we anticipate them rolling out, uh, we'll probably see the first sort of tangible example of somebody able to say, yes, that is a 5G application right there, is going to be fixed wireless access. And that's a logical way. I and mean, we saw that to some degree when uh, LTE was rolled out. Um, it's a logical way to do it. It's a good way to get some experience with it. Um, Verizon has announced that uh, by the end of this year, they'll uh, have a fixed wireless access, uh, not trials, they'll actually be uh, marketing it in several cities uh, with the hope that mobility then comes in the first quarter of 2019. Um, and so, uh, you know, so for a consumer-facing for consumer-facing um, use case, that's that's I think the early one. And so the way that'll work is, you know, you'll have equipment that looks similar to what you have now, probably more base stations and exist now, and then a receiver mounted on the outside of a house. And so that will basically be a um, a replacement or a substitute for fiber. I mean, it's it's that fast that we're looking at the kinds of speeds that you would get over a fiber connection, gigabit speeds uh, delivered to the home. So that would that would basically light up your home network. Uh, and then you know, then once we're able to add mobile, and that's for for Ericsson's products mostly the uh, the network products. That's not that much of an issue. I mean, the the difficulty is packing in this technology into mobile devices. Some of the things that you alluded to on your slide with um, uh, massive MIMO and, and beam forming. That stuff is 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 in the works, and we'll, we'll see it in in earnest next year. Um, so we'll start to see mobile devices. Uh, we hope to see over the next several years, I have some ideas of the opportunities for, um, for automation for, for IoT, and it's just staggering. I mean, globally, we're looking at you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, we, we, measure the, we measure the effect on society from 5G, and I'm not kidding, in, in the trillion dollar to trillion and a half dollar range. So it's, it's incredible. <laughs> So we can't have a conversation about 5G, in my view, without talking about spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if we could maybe go down that path a little bit. Larry touched on this a bit. And Larry, um, if you could just go back to a point, maybe expand on it a bit, as you were sort of making it clear how the capability of 5G was uniquely tied to a variety of use cases. Can you sort of talk a little bit more about the low latency and the capacity points that, that you were raising? Sure. So. Um the the, um, the 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 you know low latency again for for sort of real time critical applications, and then uh, uh, high availability for again for the similar kinds of applications. Um, obviously, we don't we don't have that kind of a of a bulletproof networking technology today. Uh, but the, what the specification calls for is making use of um, uh, very high frequencies, uh, and then in very small areas in order to greatly, you know, if you're, if you're from the old world of, of communications, it's, you know, we used to call multiplexing, where in fact you're, instead of one signal going from one place to another, you're breaking it into millions of other signals and then sending them uh, simultaneously. That's why we have all the little antennas on the other end to receive them and then put the signal back together again. 
Um, so that's going to require uh, uh, all kinds of, of not only new uses of spectrum, but, but uh, new definitions of how existing spectrum might be used, uh, the ability to sort of simultaneously share it or bounce around between different bands. Uh, if something is congested, then you just, you know, the device is the intelligence and the ability just to move uh, somewhere else that isn't as congested. Uh, or if it's got a priority user uh, that says, I need this, then they, then they vacate it immediately. And all that happening sort of seamlessly, again, at the, we're talking about the, the millisecond level of, of uh, change. So we've had already the, the you know, the, the FCC has uh, really starting uh, six or so years ago, uh, have already started, you know, recognizing that the, this this is coming, and that of course uh, spectrum allocation reallocation work takes a long time. Uh, have started multiple uh, proceedings uh, for what they call the spectrum frontiers for these very high uh, millimeter wave spectrum. Uh, figuring out, you know, some of them ha have uh, government users uh, there now, uh, some of them don't. But just sort of, you know, kind of figuring out how quickly, how much more quickly we can get that into the pipeline. Uh, and, uh, and allocated for these, if nothing else, we're testing in applications. Uh, but now we're sort of working on uh, sort of you know, lower, what we used to think of as beachfront spectrum in the 600, 700, 3.5 gig. Uh, again, they all have existing applications, so we need to find ways to, uh, to coexist or to reposition uh, certain things. Um, and you know, I'd say you know, if you sort of wanted to give the FCC a report card over the last eight years through, you know, several different, two different administrations, you'd say, uh, uh, you know, B or B plus in terms of uh, being ahead of this, and certainly relative to other countries. Uh, there is, there, there, there definitely are, are, you know, other countries that are racing uh, to get this deployed, and they, in turn, have their spectrum-related agencies uh, working overtime as well. So, you know, it's definitely a, 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 a global competition, but uh, I think so far we're doing quite well. So, Jared, can yeah. you uh, share your perspective on you know the similar topic, and and also give us a sense in terms of uh, of spectrum? A couple things. Number one, it, the lines seem to have blurred between what was defined and talked about as beachfront, you know, five years ago versus mm -hmm. you know is that term even relevant given various um, capabilities of of different spectrum bands. Number, number one. Number two, sort of what do you see happening here in the United States in terms of the federal government making uh, more spectrum available across which bands in, in furtherance of 5G? And, and how does that stack up with what you're seeing around the world? Yeah. Sorry no, to have, give you three no, questions. I, I got one. <laughs> that was about eight questions. <laughs> no, you're right. The first, to your point about the, uh, how things have changed over the years, it wasn't that long ago when low band spectrum was considered you know, less than two or three gigahertz. And now, like you just said, the sweet spot seems to be in the 3.5 gigahertz range. Um, and just for those of you who don't live and read this stuff, you know most of the most of the frequency bands that you'll see in these devices are lower, 700 megahertz. Uh, you'll get things in the in the two gigahertz range. So when we're talking about three gigahertz uh, and six, five and six, which is where Ericsson is, and then we're going way up into the high band spectrum, 24, 26, 28, and even 39 gigahertz, and beyond that, the MCC has just opened up a 95 gigahertz proceeding. It has changed a lot, and it's largely due to technology, and we're able to, you know, figure out ways to make spectrum that, you know, historically you would have thought doesn't really travel all that far, can't penetrate buildings all that well, you know, is subject to you know, the weather, if, if it should rain, um, a lot of that has been overcome. And it's also driven by the fact that to, uh, to deliver these kinds of speeds, you need really wide swaths of spectrum. Um, you know, the typical LTE network where you might think, oh, you need a 2 by 10 megahertz network or 2 by 15 or 2 by 20. If you're delivering giga, gigabit speeds, now we're talking 50 to 100 megahertz channels and so the only way to find that just you know physically is to is to start going up there um, start looking at the three gigahertz range um, and obviously in the in the upper ranges there's a lot of spectrum I mean now now you can get into the real fun stuff when you can stitch together 200 and 400 megahertz channels um, so yeah so they I think the blurring is technology based don't think that LTE is going away anytime soon um, a lot of what we do and what we've demonstrated is using LTE and 5g 
simultaneously in the same band. And so we're not talking the same kind of speeds with LTE, obviously, but you still get some of the benefits of the network, some of the low latency benefits um, that you would get when you're talking about higher speeds in, uh, in these upper, upper frequency ranges. Um, yeah, for the federal government point of view, I don't know, I might give them a, a higher grade except for uh, mid-band spectrum, but in terms of making spectrum available, uh, certainly in the higher bands and the lower bands, it's been uh, quite a feverish pace for the FCC. The Chairman Pai has announced an auction in November for 28 gigahertz. Following shortly thereafter, we're gonna look at the 24 gigahertz range. Uh, and then hopefully we'll start to see auctions of the 3.5 gigahertz range um, next year. So it puts us in a great, in, in a great shape globally. Uh, we are fearful uh, for uh, keeping the U.S. in the forefront of innovation. And if you look around the world, it's mid-band spectrum is the critical piece. We got high-band spectrum. The U.S. has actually led on low-band spectrum. I don't know if there's any other country uh, looking at 600 megahertz, and they certainly aren't looking at some of the innovative ways that we've figured out how to allocate 600 megahertz spectrum. But as mid-band is where all the activity is, and that's that's if there's a danger, it's losing the uh, it's losing the race there to uh, to Southeast Asia, to China, frankly, that they're um, they're much better able through through you know through the way their government works, it's a lot uh, easier to clear out spectrum in that range, whereas we have to contest with Incumbent users, and those incumbent users tend to uh, not just say, oh, okay, we'll leave, mobile broadband sounds better, we should probably uh, <laughs> vacate the spectrum. So it takes several years to, uh, to, uh, to work with them to, uh, to clear out ranges. And, and the big one, sorry, the big one that Chairman Pai just identified yesterday is this frequency range, what we call the C-band. It goes from 3.7 gigahertz up to 4.2 gigahertz, and uh, that's occupied today in large part by the satellite industry. And uh, this is ideal spectra. I mean, this is, you know, probably job one for Ericsson in the U.S. is that range. And so we're very encouraged to see that uh, we now have a, de a deadline for a notice of proposed rulemaking. It'll be July. Uh, and then hopefully we can move forward quickly with freeing that up for, for 5G use. All right. Well, you kind of opened the Sorry. door. <laughs> you mentioned China. Mm. So, uh, you know, without putting you into a difficult position with press here um, and your company, <laughs> just sort of explain to us how a company like Ericsson interprets and internalizes, uh, shall we say, the um, to and fro uh, from the administration as to ZTE, mm -hmm. no ZTE, yes ZTE. <laughs> sort of how, what do you guys make of, of all of that? Yeah, it's been amazing, hasn't it? And uh, the nice thing is, is that it, when we started out with this administration, it, we had this sense of frustration from our hires up, like, well, why didn't you tell me this was happening? Or why, how did you not know? And now the nice thing is everybody gets it. Everybody knows, everybody realizes, oh, this can change day to day. And, uh, and it is changing day to day. For those of you who don't know, ZTE is a major competitor of ours globally. You don't see them as much in the US for various reasons. And uh, a month, I think it was April 20th-ish, the Commerce Department announced that ZTE would effectively not be able to uh, sell equipment from any, use any U.S. suppliers to make their equipment. And it had the effect of essentially uh, having them uh, shut down their business operations. They actually do rely on uh, Qualcomm, and I think Intel, but Qualcomm in particular. Uh, and then, you know, a few, was it last week or the week before, in, in the context of, of uh, ongoing trade negotiations with China, <coughs> President Trump tweeted, and I'm not making this up, that it was, it was Chinese jobs that we should be worried about. It wasn't American Correct. jobs, but we need to worry about Chinese jobs. And he quickly in the next few days said, oh, and American companies are affected by, by this as well. So uh, then yesterday, I'm, uh, on Capitol Hill, there's a piece of legislation um, called FIRMA, don't ask me what it stands for, uh, but it, uh, it, uh, we had the Senate Banking Committee basically say in no uncertain terms through an amendment that uh, no, there will be, you know, the, you know, the president will not be able to, you know, I interrupt this <coughs> ongoing activity from the Commerce Department. So, so that's the latest, is that, uh, that at least the Senate, and, and that's bipartisan, I think that that passed with only two nay votes out of the Senate Banking Committee yesterday. So yes, right, so it's, it's a lot of whiplash. 
let's let's sort of uh, drill down on this issue of competition, which is the the title of our uh, program today, but one uh, topic that really hasn't come through. How do you see 5G enabled applications um, impacting the competitive um, sort of flavor or dynamic in this sector we call tech telecom? Um, well, I think that there was a, a recent study that came out that actually showed that the US, because of its leadership in 4G technology, actually has had an additional $100 billion uh, added annually to our GDP. So it's, it's critically important that we do maintain leadership uh, at this level uh, in 5G. I mean, our two biggest competitors, I think, right now, obviously, I think are China and South Korea are the, are the two major ones. And, and it's a close race right now. And I think it's, it's critically important that we get the right mix of, of regulations, whether or not it be adequate spectrum, uh, whether or not, and we can get into this later too, uh, citing procedures too, to make sure that we can actually deploy uh, the 5G technology that needs to get out there, or um, just creating even regulatory structures in general for, for broadband that, that are condu conducive to innovation and to further investment as well, too. So let me pick up on that. Um, the, the point was made that there is a need for wide channelization um, if we really want to optimize uh, 5G. Do you, is the U.S., the, the, our approach to allocating spectrum, um, is it out of step with the rest of the world? I, I, I think our channelization tends to be a little bit narrower or significantly narrower depending on the band as compared to maybe what some folks are doing elsewhere in the world. Is, is that been Erickson's observation? And if not, you know, where, where do we stack up? Um, I think in the upper bands, we're, we're, we're looking good. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's funny, part of the difficulty for us is living in this world with, with bands, with uh, channel sizes that haven't been contemplated from a technical point of view before. And, uh, you know, if our, our most recent struggles have been trying to convince the FCC, with some success, that uh, you need to look at this in a whole new way. You know, the way you used to look at out-of-band emissions and all these other technical concepts when you're talking about 5, 10, maybe 15 or 20 megahertz channels doesn't apply when you're talking 200 and 400. Um, so uh, yeah, I think in the upper bands we get it and I will as a company certainly push for, uh, in, especially in these, as these new bands come on, the, the C band, the 3.7 and 4.2 gigahertz band that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Ericsson will be an advocate for spectrum policies that do allow for these high, you know, high um, throughput applications and mm -hmm. require longer, mm -hmm. larger channel sizes. Larry, um, just putting on your sort of valley hat for a second, um, are, are folks out there, VCs, uh, small startups, are they kind of thinking around where they might play in 5G or? Really, it's it's not a, a topic of, of focus out there. Well, there. So, I mean, the bulk of the thinking. About, so, yes, the short answer is there's a tremendous amount of activity both on the investment side and on the on the uh, entrepreneurial side, both startups and incumbents. Uh, but the focus or the, the the way they the lens they look through it is really this lens. They look through it from the application lens. So, again, if you're a startup, you know, you're not thinking about. Uh, about 5G from a networking standpoint, you're thinking about, well, I'm going to build, you know, smart car technology or you know, a piece of the, the, the puzzle here for a smart home or some other kind of connected application. Uh, uh, they, you know, for better or for worse, I think we in the Valley take the network infrastructure for granted. Uh, we assume that, you know, as, as we're building these technologies that either need a lot more data or a, a lot wider coverage or a lot lower latency or whatever the, the technical features are that we know 5G, they're just assuming that it's going to be there um, and that when customers buy their products or, or buy their services, uh, the network that they need will be in place. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad assumption. That's generally been the rule uh, of thumb. I think uh, we learned a lot of painful lessons in the Valley around getting from 2G to 3G, uh, where the technology was there, but the applications weren't, uh, and, and you know, the application developers were really behind. Well, I think, I think we certainly overcame that in terms of, of LTE, and so I, I expect that, that you know, the, the, the sequencing will be correct here as well. But yeah, the, in the Valley, it's, it's, it's big. And, I, and to get back to your question about competition, so you know, we're, we're talking about international competition, but we should also talk about national competition as well, because obviously the, the applications that I suggest, again, any or all of them that might show up, um, 
these uh, are new businesses. In fact, some of these are new industries or they're transformations of existing industries, and both from the standpoint of the network operators, the equipment providers, and you know, what we typically think of as the edge providers, there's, there's a lot of new opportunities. It's not really clear you know, who will own the smart car business. Will it be insurance companies, for example? My, uh, some of my colleagues uh, at Accenture say you know, autonomous vehicles will be driven by insurance mm -hmm. companies. That's, that's going to really be the driver. That's a very interesting idea. Uh, all of these applications, obviously what they have in common is the, the generation, collection, analysis, and use of data, lots and lots and lots of data. So will it be cloud providers who will uh, own the, uh, the, the bulk of the sort of new, new applications and the profits that go with them? Will it be the, the device manufacturers who are collecting the data? Will it be the sensor manufacturers? We don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna suggest we know, um, I think what's exciting is what, what clearly is the case is as these new uses come online, there will be intense competition within the current industries and then between industries to figure out, you know, where is the, where is the profit and how is it going to be divvied up and who's got the right incentive to best collect the data, who's got the best incentive to analyze the data, uh, and then, you know, obviously how, how do consumer expectations fit in there. So we, we, have, we have competition internationally, but we'll also have sort of new dimensions of competition within regions, within economies. So just to pick up on that, um, and this is really for the, the three of you to react to, there's this long going, uh, ongoing debate. Uh, well, actually, I wouldn't say it's a debate. Um, there are some who would argue that wireless uh, broadband is just simply not a, um, a relevant substitute or something that's gonna be a solution for the mass market in terms of internet access. and doing things like you know, working on documents, et cetera. And then there are others who are saying, no, in fact, not only is that happening already, um, despite what some of the naysayers are saying, but in fact, 5G is gonna take that and make it ever more a reality. Um, we'd like to know how you guys think about that. Agree, disagree? Start with you. I mean, I think we definitely need to take <laughs> a technology neutral approach to how we, we run things uh, in this country as far as regulations are concerned. I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot of great potential with 5G, uh, in addition to uh, the other uh, forms of, uh, of broadband that we have out there, uh, like fiber, and there are other ideas out there being thrown around, like TV white spaces mm -hmm. being used as well, mm -hmm. too. So, you know, I think, I think an all-the-above approach is going to be what's needed. Jared? Yeah, and actually, um, I, maybe people have already experienced this. I, I'm surprised that there's still naysayers out there that there would be uh, people saying that you can't accomplish what you can with a, a wired connection, with a wireless connection. And I think that I do this when I go to hotels and you're stuck with hotel Wi-Fi, I often switch it back over to LTE because the hotel Wi-Fi is so bad. And that's effectively what you've done. I mean, when you do that, you're saying that the wireless network is actually going to be better than the wired network because you're just using Wi-Fi for this last few feet of connectivity. Um, and I agree, there should be a technology neutral approach uh, to, how we, um, to how we look at these services with a recognition that when you've got wireless technologies, you're dealing with a finite resource. And um, um, I, I, I do think that there, <clears throat> you know, and you brought this slide up, you, you mentioned network slicing was on one of your, one of your slides. Mm. And uh, we view that as a critical piece at Ericsson to the puzzle, which is uh, recognizing that there are different levels of connectivity that are needed. And um, you know, as opposed to a fiber where you pretty much have unlimited bandwidth, even with 5G, there are going to be competing uses. And so it makes, in our view, perfect sense to construct networks that are able to uh, you know, allocate radio frequencies based on needs of you know, public safety, for example, taking priority over other uses. Um, and some needs being deprioritized. I mean, there's no particular reason why you would have to provide the same kind of access to an electric power meter as you would to, you know, uh, some of the examples you gave, just, you know, editing documents in, in the cloud. Mm -hmm. All right, let us switch to um, some policy questions. And, and, and Larry, sort of picking up where you left off on your last slide, it, it, maybe each of you can react to this as well, and that is, um, what do you see as sort of the most beneficial slash positive policy lever or regulatory lever um, the FCC or any other federal agency could use to even further catalyze the speed with which 5G is going to get built? And then on the opposite side, what do you think um, are right now the, the sort of biggest barriers to attracting the investment and catalyzing you know, the speed with which we are deploying 5G? 
Uh, I can go first, because and those are two big mm -hmm. and different questions. But mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I, I can pick a single policy lever. Obviously, um, the, the two would be spectrum and and siting, uh, infrastructure related activities. Spectrum obviously is explicitly or exclusively federal. The siting stuff is a combination of federal, state, local, uh, depending on the on the jurisdiction. Um, and to me, you know. Uh, Blair Levin and I, uh, Blair at the, at the Brookings Institution and I have been writing a series of articles together about uh, what we call best practices for, for 5G. Uh, and you know, to us, the, the, rather than sort of fights between federal, state, local regulators over who has the authority to, to set time frames, clocks, prices, and, and all these other things, what we really would prefer to see is the emergence of kind of best practices uh, based on, on public-private partnerships. So, and we have a lot of examples of this already where cities, uh, regions recognize that the 5G is a, is a technology that could potentially revitalize local industries or, 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 or you know, if you're, if you're in a place where, you know, say, you're coal country and you really want a new industry, uh, you want to be health-related or you want to be education-related, that uh, getting ahead of other regions, other cities is really valuable. And instead of waiting for the who's going to make the rules, you just you don't bother with that. You actually go and work with uh, the equipment providers, work with the network operators to be an early use case city and make the kinds of accommodations, usually again on the on the siting permitting side of things that you that they need, so that you get the technology earlier. And you don't have to worry about, you know, was there a shot clock and was there a fee schedule mandated by one uh, jurisdiction or another? Uh, and that's what we're, you know, we really want to see more of. We want to see more of these, these uh, private-public partnerships where the, the regions or the cities work with the providers to get the technology in and get the benefits as, as quickly as possible. Um, so your second question was about biggest uh, barriers to investment. I think the biggest barriers to investment is what I started my presentation, which mm -hmm. is that Wall Street um, maybe does not see the bigger picture. You know, they, they think about 5G and they say, you know, the LTE network is doing great and, and, and it's improved tremendously and all the concerns we had initially about capacity and spectrum uh, in the early days of the iPhone, bless you, um, ha have been overcome. So why, you know, why would we spend trillions of dollars on a new network? And again, especially if you think new network means you throw out the old network, which is not the case. So I, I think the biggest barrier is just communicating uh, that this is not just gimmicks and gadgets, that in fact this is uh, you know, kind of socially important, life-changing, you know, in terms of, you know, you know of, of public safety and, and lives saved and sustainability and energy use and, uh, and all the other things that these technologies uh, could do. Um, I think communicating that better both to consumers, policymakers, and to Wall Street, uh, that's, that, that would be the biggest obstacle I would see. Um, and you said it, I think that right now the, uh, the biggest beneficial policy lever that I can see is the uh, activity around siting. Um, it's not going to be like we throw out a network, but it is going to be the case that we are going to need a lot more cell sites. And a lot of it is education. I think that when you uh, demonstrate to municipalities that the towers of the future in part, be, or they're not the towers, but the base stations of the future in part because of the nature of the technology are a lot smaller than they used to be. We're not talking about, for the most part, um, antennas that are three and four feet tall. They can be, you know, they can be the size of, you know, we've said pizza box, but that was a few years ago, so we don't even use the term pizza box anymore. Now they're sort of hockey puck size is what you're, <laughs> is what you're looking at. Um, so, and I, I, I am, uh, uh, yeah, I am encouraged by that. I think that the FCC is moving in the right direction. Going back to a sort of a global competition point of view though, uh, I, our CEO for North America spoke at an event and mentioned that I think it's something over the, over 70, uh, there are over 70 potential tower siting authorities, whether they're uh, county governments or state governments within the Dallas area itself. Wait, I'm sorry, did you, you say the, 70 yeah, just in the Dallas yeah, area? Yeah, just in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Don't ask me oh. to name them all, but there are a bunch. Well, it's a, big, it is them, a, it's a big area. Right, and each one of them has some That's say Texas. in where you can, where you can uh, deploy, deploy cell sites. That seems right. crazy. Um, so if we can get over that, and if you look to China, there's one. You know, it's not that hard. If you can solve the problem there, you don't have, you know, there, it's not as complex as it is here. Um, so I think that that, and I think that the FCC is definitely taking that seriously, Congress is as well. 
And so that's one of the bigger policy levers that I think could, could speed things up. The other one being um, just access to spectrum. Uh, we have an FCC that's very, very busy and um, seemingly incapable. I don't mean that as a criticism. I think that it is a lot of work, but it's, it, it does auctions seriatim. So you have to wait until the 20 gigahertz auction before you can be talking about the 24 gigahertz auction. And that's after you get through the Connect America Fund auctions. And then maybe we'll get to 3.7 and 4.2 and 3.5 for that matter next year or the year after that. Mm -hmm. So the timing could be, could be improved so uh, you know, if there were a way to funnel more money to the auctions division in the wireless bureau at the FCC, that would, that would be helpful. Um, one of the biggest, or I don't say this is, I don't know how to quantify it, but a barrier to investment, and um, I hate to go there, but I will, and that is you know, we have actually seen the net neutrality debate enter into oh, certainly we were deployment. So close. I know, we I had to do it. Term. We were into this for an it. hour and five minutes. And I'll tell you why <laughs> it's, a, it's an important aspect to what we're talking about here is the recognition that there are different levels of access that you might sure. need. There's a lot of, I mean, I get it, I understand the other side to it, and, I, you know, and I'm very sympathetic, and I do think that. Uh, uh, legislation is the way to go. Everybody agrees that companies shouldn't be blocking and throttling traffic. I think that the debates are about prioritization, and if you want to use a boogeyman, paid prioritization, that sounds terrible. I don't think it's really that issue. I think it's differentiation of traffic and a recognition that certain types of traffic should be treated with a higher priority than other types of traffic, and there are very good reasons to do so, and that doing so doesn't necessarily impact you as a user's experience. But I've seen it. I, I know there's this attitude that, uh, oh, no, network management is OK. So you know, companies like Ericsson and the operators don't have to worry about it. But I've been in discussions with companies. I mean, I've seen you know, on the other side of the table, working with operators, have them say, I don't think we can do that. You know, I, I, we would love to be able to uh, you know, differentiate traffic in that way. But it says here we have to treat everything the same. This looks like it's, you know, looks like it's prioritization, so therefore it's off the table. So, you know, back to the whipsaw pace of uh, movement, not just in the ZTE context, but in the net neutrality context. You know, it would be nice to just end this and, you know, regardless of whether Title II's on the table or off the table, just come up with a legislative solution that makes it clear what the rules of the road are. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'll have to go ahead and take the third rail as well, too. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll start with that since we started there. I mean, I think that what is one of the largest impediments to business anywhere, and that's regulatory uncertainty. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now with the net neutrality debate um, is, is an important distinction that needs to be made between what is net neutrality and what is Title II. Right. Um, net neutrality, um, the Chamber fully supports. Um, at the same time, uh, we believe it's Title II classification of broadband, which essentially treated the Internet in some respects like a public utility, that were a drag on investment. We saw, and some studies have shown, that we saw investment decline for the first time outside the context of a, of a recession uh, for broadband ever, and that was over two years under Title II. Uh, wireless as well, too. We've seen some studies from CTIA that showed that as well. Um, so I think, and I, and I agree, I think in the long term, we need Congress to step in, provide some regulatory certainty, and, and you know, set some rules of the road regarding net neutrality. But at the same time, let's, let's keep the light touch regulatory approach and not go to Title II, which had the, gave the FCC the ability to regulate things like privacy uh, in a way that was more onerous than to the edge providers. Um, also, after the fact, rate regulation and, and creating uh, broad uh, mandates and broad requirements like the, uh, the general conduct standard. Those are the things we'd like to see go away. Net neutrality, we'd, we'd like to see. Um, in terms of siting, we're totally in agreement as well, too. I mean, I think that the big issue is educating localities not to have a short-sighted mentality of let's use siting fees to generate revenue mm -hmm. um, and then inhibit investment in 5G deployment. As you said before, with the, the small hockey puck size nodes that we have out there, a lot of these localities are employing a large cell tower mentality to how they site and, uh, and impose fees on uh, using uh, public rights away to put these uh, nodes on there. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Newport Beach, California has a $10,000 a pop uh, rental fee uh, to use public rights away to site per node. Mm -hmm. You put that together, that gets to be pretty cost prohibitive 
uh, if you're a, a provider going into that area. Um, a few counties around here, I mean, we had issues in Fairfax. I know that Virginia has since passed a, a, a bill uh, dealing with that. Uh, Montgomery County also has some, some uh, revenue-based uh, siting fees as well. So the chamber, we, we believe that these localities should be uh, charging uh, what's necessary to site and not using these fees as a means of generating revenue on the local level. These localities are denying themselves what some estimates say over the next seven years would be $275 billion in investment by providers, which would lead to 3 million jobs nationally and $500 billion uh, extra in GDP. So it's really just um, using the FCC's authority in some regards to preempt some of these unnec unnecessary and uh, onerous siting fees. I mean, you don't get an industry that's more interstate than telecommunications. So uh, for my friends on the right, I mean, I think that that's, you know, if you're looking at uh, kind of an interstate commerce strict construction view of the Constitution, I mean, I think that's a perfect opportunity for uh, the FCC to step in. Uh, but I think, yes, I think, you know, really... Uh, driving home the fact that we need to make our mindset about siting more focused on the 5G age and not back on the old cell tower age. You know, to, to pick up on a point Larry made in terms of the Wall Street perspective and needing some education, I think what often um, a point that gets overlooked is these guys tend to look at this as a really big spend mm -hmm. without a clear path to a return on that investment. And that's where all of this then intersects with this, you know, whipsawing on a regulatory framework for, for how, how this will work and, and what's permissible and what's not. Let me pause and um, ask if there's anyone in the audience with any questions. We'd love to hear from you guys. Yes, right down here in front. Perfect. And I would just ask that you uh, introduce yourself. Uh, so, Wendy Bamadero, I work for Silver Line Communications uh, out of uh, Texas Corner. So, if you think about the Well, um, I'd actually point you to Accenture did a really great study on this, um, and it actually did a great case study of the increased uh, GDP and the increase in jobs, even for small, mid-sized, and large cities. But just some of the, the benefits that you'll see on a city level, I think Larry pointed to this too, and some of the efficiencies you'll have through providing services, through uh, being able to know when to, to pick up trash from a certain uh, receptacle and not having to just waste money going all over town. You can go right to where the service is needed. Um, you know, there are cities that are employing gunshot technology right now. So if, if, if a gunshot is heard, sensors can be used to, to take uh, law enforcement there. Uh, so I think that there are a lot of different benefits that you can get from the efficiencies that are just created. And, and I would definitely recommend there's a, a 5G smart city uh, study that Accenture did, I would definitely uh, lead you in the direction of because it has a lot of great data on a city by city level. So it sounds like one of the, the, the first and, and sort of low hanging fruit benefits would be because they can save money in providing the services that they typically provide as a local government, then perhaps that revenue can be used to offset other things, um, reduce taxes. I'm sure that would never happen, but you know, you, you can play out the scenario where you know, cash-strapped localities can, without having to charge excessive fees for the infrastructure siting, can actually realize more revenue in the longer term or even in the near term through some of these cost savings. Any, any other question? Uh, go ahead right here in the middle and then we'll come back. Um, so this is for the whole panel, but maybe Jared can answer can you it best. Just introduce yourself if you don't Oh, mind? I'm Alex Wiltz. I'm with. Uh, I'm a reporter with Event Driven. Great. Uh, so we. Uh, I'm. I'm curious to think. Know what you think about the impending Sprint T-Mobile deal, <laughs> and <laughs> specifically with regard to Spectrum and how they could affect Spectrum in the future. And if that is this merger needed, could maybe these companies instead of merging, they could have access to these the mid-band system specifically that Sprint has in the future, yeah, <laughs> rather than merging, yes. <laughs> All right, I'm who wants so, to take that one first? <laughs> sorry, I'll disappoint you. I'm, I'm not going to, I really can't go and comment on her. There, there are customers, so I, um, sorry, maybe somebody else can feel more confident <laughs> about them. <laughs> 
like, like Spectrum and antitrust, I hate splitting of the pie questions, but I will give you a non-answer. I think it's great what we're seeing uh, with T-Mobile getting more Spectrum after the incentive auction, and we're glad to uh, to see that the repack funds were actually uh, appropriated by Congress to make sure that um, broadcast stations could go and move offline quicker after the incentive auction, and also we can get more Spectrum available for 5G and for wireless through those. So. Nice deflection. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll give a real, so I'll give a real answer because I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any constraints. So I, I think I think the merger is essential. Uh, I don't think that uh, that Sprint has a path to 5G. I think that's really what the, the this merger is about. Is is not current business, although that's certainly a consideration. But in terms of looking ahead to the future, uh, given Sprint's infrastructure, given Sprint's 5G uh, spectrum holdings, I don't think they have a path to 5G. And what I like about the idea of the merger is, uh, I know that the, the, one of the, the, the sort of math question as we go from four to three, I actually think of it as going from two to three, because I think the, the merged entity would be a, a much more serious competitor to, to Verizon and AT&T than the, than the other two are now. And so in fact, I, in some ways, it makes the competitive landscape even more uh, uh, robust and dynamic. So I, I, I hope they do it. Let me um, just add one point onto what Larry said. I, I think as, as combined, you know, putting aside Sprint's track record on being able to integrate companies um, in, a, in, a, in a timely and efficient and effective way, uh, let's assume they do. And, <laughs> and I think this isn't just potentially a stronger, more robust competitor to Verizon and AT&T in the mobile space, but you should look at this more broadly in terms of maybe that is a new competitive pressure on folks in the cable space yeah, or right. other yeah. are, are there mm. industry sectors that are providing internet access if, if this truly is capable of pursuing a 5G strategy. Now, I would take issue with the way in which the companies are trying to market their merger inside the belt by, by essentially creating the impression that no one else in the, in the United States is doing anything about 5G except for you know, what they have on the table is, is, a, is a bit ludicrous. But I think on its own, it'd be really interesting in terms of the competitive dynamic that might result. Again, much more broadly than just within the wireless industry itself. Yeah, and I would, I, th that's very important, and I, I would agree with that. The, we, we talked before about intramodal competition in terms of fixed wireless. Um, but yes, clearly, to the extent that, that there's any skepticism about the existence of intram, inter, intermodal competition, um, once we're in the 5G world, it's clear that the, that the competition between wired and, and wireless uh, becomes much more intense. And therefore, you know, from a consumer standpoint, it changes the dynamic, but, but, but clearly gives consumers more and different options. What exactly those options will look like, we don't know. It's going to be exciting to see, but uh, definitely uh, not only, as Carolyn says, more competition within the wireless world, but, but more robust competition between wired and wireless. I think I saw a hand over here in the green, and then we'll go back up to you. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Leila Ribeiro, and I work at, with Mater uh, in McLean. And uh, my question is uh, regarding the uh, spectrum. You, all of you, or most of you, mentioned spectrum as uh, a lever uh, when you asked the question. Uh, so do you believe that if the FCC I mean, is able to auction all the spectrum that has been identified for 5G, are we... I mean, are we good? Is this <laughs> enough? <laughs> is, it, is it ever enough? That's the question. Yeah. So, so well, how, I mean, in terms of how they expect that the 3.5, for instance, in the mid-band and the, and the millimeter wave, yeah. is there the, is, is, does that meet the projected? Yeah, are we limit? done? I don't know. I think your point is well said. It's, it's, it, it'll never be enough. Uh, <laughs> but if you were, if, if, you, if you do look at the positive movement and on, in, the, in what's now in the mid-band, and you've got even more, you know, NTIA has identified even 100 megahertz below 3.5. So now we're looking at 3.4 to 3.5. We've got 3.5 to 3.7, potentially all the way up to 4.2. Um, that will go a long way. And in terms of high band spectrum, you know, again, I'm not going to say it's, it's enough, but there's a lot of activity there. And I, uh, I'll just go back to the point that, you know, the, the, the difficulty with spectrum is not so much identifying it. We have a pretty good idea of what spectrum would make sense to provide the type of services that we would want to provide. But looking at ways, because there's no low-hanging fruit left, there's no, you know, there's there's nothing empty. So it's looking at innovative ways to uh, 
to repurpose it, in, in Erickson's opinion, um, to its highest, best use, which is for, for mobile broadband. Um, and so I, you know, I, the question isn't, I don't think, should be, is it ever enough? There'll, there'll always be uh, a need, but I think it'll be a more interesting study over the next few years to see what things work and what doesn't. We've got incentive auctions. They seem to have worked. Um, we also have a model for using spectrum in these mid-bands where you have a spectrum access system, a SAS, that mediates among different demands for spectrum. If that works, great. We haven't seen it work yet. And uh, you know, so I, I think that the answer is there will always be a need for spectrum, but how you, how you fix it is going to be where all the activity is. I think we have a gentleman right in the middle in the blue shirt, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the back with the maroon shirt. You, you maybe don't see this here. side of the room, Carolyn, but well, definitely had some I'd hands work, up on this side of the room I'd for a while. I work the uh, mic that way and then down. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul. I'm a student. I was just wondering if anyone had thoughts or predictions on the Legato decision before the FCC and what kind of precedent that might set for future deployment efforts, particularly as it relates to disruption concerns on other, you know, I know Defense Department has some concerns about GPS, things like that. Thanks. So I've, I've written a couple times on, on Legato over the last couple of years. Um, the, 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 the question has always been about, about interference, and one of the things we've sort of learned from the Legato experience is how the FCC defines interference and how it measures interference is not very sophisticated. It's not really evolved much since the, the 1930s. Um, and it's really left to the parties. And I'm not just talking here about the God, I'm, you can go back through several previous examples. Uh, it's really left it to the parties to work things out. And when it turns out when you have multiple parties, multiple industries involved, that, that just doesn't work very well. So I, I, my sense is that Legato has, has resolved all of the real issues. There's still some uh, you know, claims of interference issues, but I don't think there is plausible as the ones that they've already resolved through various agreements and joint ventures. And I, I, would, I don't have, have no insight into what the FCC is going to do, but I, I would hope that they would uh, move forward soon uh, because that you know, more low, you know, we even talk about uh, low orbit satellites as another form of, of competition, but obviously uh, that has tremendous potential, again, to increase consumer potential opportunities for how they get their, how they get their uh, connectivity and, fr and from where. So I hope it moves forward, and my sense is it should, but uh, I, I, I won't go all the way into the weeds on why. So Legato, I think, is a, um, and Professor Mayo and I have talked about this, is, is a perfect case study at some point because, you know, I, I, like many companies, you know, they sort of had a plan as to how they were going to prosecute what, what they were um, trying to get done. And as we were saying before, sort of this regulatory uncertainty issue, you know, can really have an impact on business. This is a perfect example. In contravention of normal process and procedure, prior FCC, I think, gave this company under another name some assurances that perhaps that commission wasn't really in a position to do. And business decisions were made. Money was spent uh, as, a, as a, and reliance on that. And now here we are. So I would just, I think it's going to be a really interesting case study when we see how this all wraps up. All right, now we are going to go ahead. Red shirt, and then we're coming here to Debbie. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Barber. I'm a consultant to Debbie, uh, communication workers. I've been focusing on pretty much everything what you all have been discussing with a specific attempt to understand the backhaul requirements in rural areas. From what I see that to have the sufficient latency that's required for a lot of these applications, you have to bring the data centers and the clouds closer to the edge. When you look at, at, at least the, the nationwide fiber maps, there are huge holes. Don't want you to comment on Sprint T-Mobile, but they've talked about nationwide 5G availability. I mean, they're using massive MIMO. Obviously, there's millimeter wave and so forth, but whatever, it appears as there's going to be enormous increases in the, uh, the data capacity that, that uh, will be required, and I'm just wondering if anyone can comment uh, about either the availability or the additional cost of providing that kind of backhaul 
whether it's through fiber or um, microwave or whatever, particularly in rural areas. Yeah, I can, I can try. I don't know the specific cost, but you're right. I mean, if you, if you have gigabit connections, then you have to have some way to get gigabit speeds out to the tower. But it's, it, and you talked about this a little bit. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be all fiber. In fact, we're able to do, you know, in some of the bands that we're looking at to provide consumer solutions uh, and solutions for businesses and IoT solutions, you're actually able to reuse that spectrum for microwave backhaul. In fact, a lot of it is used for microwave backhaul today. And so we, we, we see the two getting along and, and working hand in hand. Um, you're right, rural areas are always going to be a challenge. There's always going to be a role for uh, the FCC uh, and uh, other policies uh, to uh, make sure that there's some funding out there because it costs money to deliver speeds when the population densities just, just aren't what you have in the cities. So uh, you know, FCC is looking at innovative ways to bring it out. I don't know to what degree they're looking at backhaul as a part of that. That's a, actually, it's a good question. I, I know that when they talk about Connecting America Fund, you're always talking about end users. I don't know if really backhaul figures into it. But um, you know, there are multiple ways to solve this problem. It doesn't necessarily have to be fiber. Debbie. Uh, there seemed to be agreement that siting and uh, the investment issues are, and spectrum are the two challenges. I didn't hear any mention of workforce. And so my question is to Jared. You guys make a lot of the equipment that's put in the small cells. Who actually installs them? And are you finding what are the skills that they need, and are you finding challenges there? It is hard. I, I can't speak to specifics just because I don't have as much of a background, but I do know that that is a challenge. And so, you know, companies like Ericsson do it, tower companies do it as well, and operators do it. So, you know, it's it's the three groups, and maybe there are others, but it's at least it's us three groups that are that are involved. And it is a unique skill set. There are other trade associations, um, thinking about WI in particular, who, are, who uh, actually have training programs and are able to um, offer some sort of certification uh, for skilled tower climbers, for example. Um, but yes, I, I think that we have, and I, I wish I could tell you some numbers, I don't have them at, at my fingertip, but I do think that that is gonna be one of the major challenges if you're looking at, you know, uh, network densification over the next few years, it is going to be an issue coming up with enough people to actually put this stuff on in the ground. Or not in the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, we'll take our last question. Uh, nope, sorry, we have two. How about, oh, well, wait, well, three. Is, All right, how about um, Amanda, not to make you walk around. Can we um, have this gentleman here and then the, the young lady up there in the green? And then we'll come back over here. Thank, Thank you. you guys for all these great questions. Um, Eli Albagli, GAO. Uh, we talk about competition and competition for spectrum. We really haven't touched between licensed and unlicensed and the mm -hmm. impact on innovation. And does thing, things like smart antennas and, and, and uh, smart access systems um, negate that issue? I'll, as moderator, I will say no. <laughs> I mean, as Jared was saying, you know, what we all experienced a couple years ago was you could go anywhere, you know, to any hotel and fire up your Wi-Fi, and it was great. But as more people started to use that, that's also a resource that becomes congested, not, not, un, not unlike license spectrum. So there's nothing unusual about what happens when you have a lot of people using. Mm -hmm. The question then is, you know, going forward, what's the appropriate balance uh, to be struck in terms of the total amount of allocations? I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jared. I think the United States is still one uh, is the leader in the world in terms of the total amount of spectrum allocated for unlicensed uses, i.e. we have the most yeah. amount allocated for that versus license. Is that still true? It sounds right. I, I know it's a, it's a fair amount. And then from, from our perspective, you know, we generally have a preference for licensed spectrum, but that's at a very high level. And we and our customers work together to actually incorporate the two of them. And, um, uh, I'll just point out that licensed, or that unlicensed spectrum doesn't equal Wi-Fi, and more and more we're finding technologies that have historically been thought of as just on, just a licensed technology being used on unlicensed spectrum, 
And there's a lot of magic there and there's a lot of opportunities for small rural companies that might not have been able to afford Spectrum at auction now can augment some of their holdings with license, with unlicensed or, or lightly licensed Spectrum. You know, in the 3.5 band, I'm thinking of the general authorized access Spectrum in particular. You can see scenarios where you pair licensed with unlicensed and make it one big whole. All right, go ahead. Kyle Burgess with Consumers Research. Uh, thanks for the great panel. Um, earlier when we were talking about uh, barriers to investment, uh, several panelists mentioned education, um, both I guess to like municipalities and state uh, representatives and, and involved in siting, um, but also to consumers. And I'm just curious, um, on both the educating government side and educating consumer side, what do you think the most effective types of education would be, or what is most useful to you as industry, Jared? Um, just, you know, this is something that's in our power to do, and we want to be helpful. I mean, I think on the consumer side, I think a lot of times we get kind of the NIMBY uh, attitude that's out there, uh, and that's one of the, the big barriers, I think, in a lot of places. Once again, we're talking about with the old cell tower mindset you hear, uh, equipment's going to be uh, deployed in an area and you start thinking it's the big giant towers you see on the side of the highway and that's just not the case. Uh, these things are uh, for the most part um, pretty concealed. Uh, they don't really affect the aesthetics of an area uh, that much and I think just as every technology that's, that's new I always say try it out because when you see it up, up close it's actually not as, as scary as, as kind of the hype is always said. Um, I think yes and I think from a, a from a locality perspective, a government perspective, I think showing the benefits um, from, from an efficiency standpoint to job creation standpoint to GDP uh, increase, I think that's also important. Uh, I mean, also too, I mean, um, you know, just, you know, another point we didn't touch on today as well too was the federal uh, citing issues as well that we've seen some movement on. Um, the fact that we've seen Chairman Carr, or Commissioner Carr of the FCC, uh, has really led this effort to uh, reduce hurdles um, with regard to small cells uh, on federal lands. And once again, you know, educating uh, you know, citizenry that these are not going to be aesthetically harmful. You know, if a, a thing, something has to go in a national park, uh, you know, if a small cell has to be on federal property, you know, it, under the CARS plan, it won't have to undergo NEPA review or historic preservation review. And in most cases, those... Um, those reviews didn't actually cause a denial of being able to go in, but it did cause a lot of paperwork. It caused a lot of um, you know, time trying to get uh, the applications in that could have been spent elsewhere. And uh, under his plan, actually, uh, it's been estimated that it will free up $1.6 billion over nine years that can be used toward further deployments elsewhere to do things like bridge the digital divide. You know, where I, where I live, those are one, those are, they're one and the same thing, both in terms of educating consumers and educating government. I live in a small piece of unincorporated uh, Contra Costa County up in the Berkeley Hills. And when we have requests for infrastructure in, in the community, antennas, et cetera, uh, it goes essentially, first hurdle is a, a citizen board, uh, an advisory council. And so these are my neighbors, and they have all the best intentions, and they're very smart people. Many of them are, are Berkeley faculty. Uh, they have no idea what they're being asked to look at. It's, so it's not that they're charging too much. Mm. It's not that they don't want it. They just don't know what it is. Um, and so going back to my original point, that to me, the, the education, whether it's government or consumers, in my case, they're the same, is what is this, not what is, what is 5G, but what is it for? Um, and, and why is it important in terms of, as you say, job creation, in terms of, of cost savings? Why should they care? Why, why should they move on this item on the agenda when you know, somebody's asking for an addition to their house? That's something they understand. They know how to evaluate that. This other stuff, it's confusing to them. And, no one, and there really is no, there's no resource for them to say, you know, how do I even learn how to do my job as a, as a member of this advisory council? How do I even find out? what it is I'm being asked to do. And I think that's a, that's a, a very large hole and lots of ways to fill it, but, but definitely needs to be filled. All righty, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Kerry Ingram. I'm from the Department of Commerce. Um, my question is a little bit on a, a different topic in this area. Uh, as you know, in order to make uh, 5G a reality, to make all these use cases a reality, 
a big area that needs to be determined are the technical standards and technology standards um, that need to be developed and deployed. And the, the U.S. approach is mostly industry-driven, industry-led uh, technology development, but a number of other countries and competitors around the world, their approach is a little more top-down, governments heavily involved in setting standards and developments. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about the U.S. falling behind, uh, given the heavy dose of government uh, uh, engagement in a technical standards area. My, so my question is, one, uh, is the U.S. approach uh, going to be effective enough in maintaining leadership uh, in the 5G technology space? And second, uh, is there anything that, that the panelists feel the government should be doing to, to help U.S. tech companies uh, continue to lead in the area of uh, technical standards? Uh, You've stunned us into silence. No, that's a good, it's an, uh, <laughs> no we know it's an it's important a good question. question. And the FCC, for I mean, that's from my perspective, it's the FCC. And they are involved in um, standards activities. Could it be more? Yeah, I think it I, I think it'd be ab absolutely could be more. Um, uh, we generally see eye to eye, so Erickson would welcome that. Uh, we do prefer, I, I, I mean, if, if, if implied in your question is that you've got, you know, effectively state-run enterprises, you know, sort of stacking the deck and showing up at, um, there's a standards group called 3GPP, throwing up at 3GP, showing up at 3GPP meetings with, you know, dozens of people and just for the purpose of flooding it. Yeah, we do see it. Um, we're able, you know, we as Ericsson have the resources to uh, to make sure that we're represented. Our, I'm sure Nokia and Samsung and uh, uh, other companies do as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it could be more and more of, it is a competitive issue. I mean, it's not more and more of one, it is a competitive issue. And when we view it as such, and you know, we have a team of, I think it's about 100 people just devoted to one standards group, this 3GPP group. And uh, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, I think that you know more and more countries and their state-owned enterprises will recognize that this is a way to to game the system. So you know, we can continue the discussion. I I, I know that it's been brought up before, and uh, I, I I think that it is going to be something that's going to be more and more important. Yeah, it's a concern. Trade wars happen in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not always explicit, um, and and this is certainly one way. Uh, and, you know, we, we've seen with, with some of our trading partners using the standards process as, as a way of, of, of punishing successful American companies, um, definitely a concern. I think I saw a stat at a, um, it might have been a CTIA um, conference and, and one of their member companies who is a, um, uh, an equipment vendor had the stat that in China they were doing um, sort of a little field trial and they were able to deploy about 30,000 small cells in three months, whereas here in the United States, it could take, it sometimes takes years to locate, not necessarily a small cell, but a single uh, piece of infrastructure. So putting aside, you know, the, the sand that various countries try to throw into the standards process, you have the very pragmatic, very real boots on the ground issue. If our companies are constrained from building out the, the, the infrastructure, you know, a lot of other countries uh, who don't have to ask permission to do that will certainly are poised to take the lead. So it is a, a very real issue. All righty, well, I want to thank everybody here. If you didn't have a chance to ask a question, I think uh, for a few minutes we'll be around. Mm -hmm. I wanted to thank you to each of our speakers. This was a really great conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Georgetown event. So thank you again. Thanks.